Welcome all to the second day of the first annual International Youth Symposium, the Arctic in 25 Years. We're very uh, pleased to present this event from the Polar Institute at the Wilson Center in partnership with Arctic Frontiers, the Arctic Council Indigenous Peoples Secretariat, and the Arctic Youth Ambassadors Program. As the Arctic undergoes rapid change, it's crucial that we think about the next 25 years and pave the way for policy adaptation today. Yesterday, we heard about the ways climate change is opening up a blue ocean economy, the importance of free prior and informed consent when building Arctic development, the impacts of climate change on indigenous languages and the inherent knowledge embedded within them, as well as the importance of centering marginalized peoples in policy and the primacy of relationship building in this work. At the Wilson Center, we're very pleased to have worked with our partners to make this event possible. And before we begin, we have video remarks from Ms. Anu Fredrickson from Arctic Frontiers. Dear participants, welcome to the first Arctic Youth Symposium. In a time of an ongoing pandemic, this event is digital, but we still set the agenda. This event is historic. First of its kind, we are proud to shed light on the emerging Arctic leaders' views. This event is also a sign of our... The youth have always been actively engaged. Now you have reached the front stage also in Arctic affairs. Arctic Frontiers has worked with youth engagement for years. We continue to bring up the youth perspective through our Arctic Frontiers Young Program, locally, regionally, and on a pan-Arctic level. From kindergarten through high school kids to young professionals joining our Emerging Leaders Program, our ambition is to accommodate for and follow the future Arctic leaders on their path. Our mission is simple. We want to help foster emerging Arctic leaders. We want to inspire, support, and encourage. We want the youth to see opportunities where others' vision is limited. Be inspired where others see lack of opportunities. Have their voices heard when others remain silent. Our mission is global because we believe that multilateralism is not dead. Because we believe that the Arctic gains from dialogue from across the borders. And because we believe that the Arctic has a lot to offer on a global stage. Our mission is one for the future. We work for knowledge-based growth and sustainable development of the region we call home. We, the people of the Arctic, are the best stewards of our land. And we want to leave for the future because our faith is strong. Arctic can be our incubator. Incubator for good ideas that serve the global good. Arctic Youth Symposium will tackle core issues. Cross-border collaboration between indigenous youth, just transition and economic development, co-production of knowledge, and governance and ways to mitigate future challenges. All issues of high relevance for your future and mine. Our engagement in lifting up young voices has deep roots in Arctic Frontiers organization. For the first time, we have joined our forces with our friends and colleagues across the Arctic. Our joint work has the potential to be a driving force for change. Arctic Frontiers is proud to collaborate with Wilson Center Polar Institute, Arctic Youth Ambassadors, and Arctic Council Permanent Participants Youth, supported by the Arctic Council Indigenous Peoples Secretariat here in Tromsø. For us at Arctic Frontiers, this event is a starting point for what we envision as a dynamic collaboration. My wish is that she will develop a lifelong love for Arctic affairs. I have. Dear all, 
Be open, be brave, engage, inspire each other, inspire us. Let us build pathways for the future together. And next time, I do hope we can meet in person. So a big thank you to Anu Friedrichsen for those welcoming remarks. I heard there might have been a little feedback in the beginning, so we apologize for that. Uh, as we carry on, we are all aware that this is the 25th anniversary of the Arctic Council, and this week is the ministerial meeting taking place in Reykjavik. And it, as we are celebrating the past 25 years, it's important to look forward to the next 25 years. We also have some welcoming remarks on behalf of the United States. Uh, and I will start those now. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Jim DeHart. I'm the U.S. Coordinator for the Arctic Region at the U.S. Department of State. I'm honored to have the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you today, and I'm grateful to the Wilson Center, Arctic Frontiers, and the Arctic Council Indigenous Peoples Secretariat for inviting me to speak. Now, normally I would be coming to you live, but today I'm traveling to Iceland to join Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, who will be participating in the Arctic Council Ministerial in Reykjavik. It's an exciting moment in Arctic diplomacy with the Arctic Council celebrating its 25th anniversary. And although we'll be looking back at what the Arctic Council has accomplished in the last 25 years, more importantly, we'll be looking ahead at the next 25 years of Arctic cooperation. And as we look to the future, I think today's conference has exactly the right focus a focus on youth, on future generations, and on indigenous communities. And that is all of you who are going to inherit the decisions that the eight Arctic foreign ministers will make in the coming days. And I think without a doubt, your voice is more important than ever. Global interest in the Arctic continues to grow, and those of you already studying and working on the many issues that make it such a dynamic region are getting a head start in defining the Arctic's future. And there are so many ways to be involved. There's safety and security, scientific research, economic development, the climate crisis, and the needs of local indigenous communities. All of these areas are fascinating and important in their own right but it's connecting them together in one cohesive approach that is a real challenge. So whether you live in Iqaluit, in Tromso, Ak, or in Kotzebue, I would submit that you, or rather we, all have an interest in ensuring that the Arctic remains peaceful, free of conflict, and a place where international cooperation prevails. We all have an interest in seeing residents of the Arctic, including indigenous communities in our own state of Alaska, have good livelihoods, good health, and the opportunity to prosper. And all of us certainly have an interest in tackling the climate crisis, a global effort in which the Arctic is an important domain because it's warming three times faster than the rest of the world. Solving the climate crisis will require a whole of society effort in which youth play a critical role. Scientists tell us that if we are to avoid the most catastrophic effects of climate change, we will need to limit the Earth's warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. That requires real commitment and real action right now to preserve your future. We in the United States government see the Arctic Council as the region's premier multilateral forum, and we expect it to remain so for the next 25 years and beyond. We've done a lot together through the Arctic Council, together with other members, 
We've negotiated significant agreements on marine environmental response, on search and rescue, and on scientific cooperation. The Arctic Council's working groups not only help us understand what's happening in the region, but they also galvanize efforts by governments and communities to address the toughest challenges. And one of the great strengths of the Arctic Council is that the indigenous peoples of the region have a seat at the table together with the eight Arctic governments. Also, it's a rare venue where the United States and Russia cooperate productively. We would like to see youth further involved in the Arctic Council so that we have your perspective and your new ideas to make this forum even more effective. And of course, it's just as important to make your voices heard in your own communities. Remote communities in the Arctic are eager for better services, better infrastructure, greater connectivity, better health, and investment to create jobs and sustain livelihoods. The right kinds of investment, for example, in clean and renewable energy, can help solve the climate crisis and guard against the kinds of unsustainable investments that could damage Arctic communities. We want to see the Arctic open for business in a positive way that works for all of us. People sometimes ask, what does success look like in the Arctic? I think success is an Arctic region that is synonymous with international cooperation, where scientific integrity prevails, and where those who live in the region are empowered to lead the lives that they want to lead. Arctic youth, of course, have perhaps the biggest stake in this success, and also a responsibility, I think, to help shape that future and make that success a reality. So thank you very much for listening. I wish you the very best, and I look forward to seeing everything that you are going to accomplish in and for the Arctic in the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you to Mr. Jim DeHart and to all of us here today. As you know, we gathered you here today because you are already leaders in your own right with the expertise, the skills, and the knowledge to influence Arctic policy. And it's been a great pleasure and honor to have worked with everyone so far in the Arctic Council Youth Panel, as well as the uh, Economic Development and Infrastructure Panel. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Larry Ibrahim Bahamut in order to start our panel on climate change and biodiversity action and research. All of you are welcome to send questions to polar at wilsoncenter.org throughout today's panels. Larry, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela, and um, nice to be here. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone watching us today. I'm Larry Ibrahim Mohammed. I'm your moderator for today's um, session, and I'm seated here, right here in the Arctic capital of Tromsø, um, specifically at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. Um, in 25 years, uh, we will be accounting to a younger generation um, on our stewardship as vanguards for the Arctic. And what is important is what kind of decision and what kind of solution do we leave behind for the younger generation that come after us? First of its kind, really, the Arctic Youth Symposium in 25 years is one of the watershed moments of our lives in deciding and taking action now. On this panel, we will focus on climate change and biodiversity action and research. We will discuss um, the relationship between Arctic indigenous peoples and the Arctic environment, um, co-production of knowledge and how it relates to climate change. This session also explores how we can build pathways um, in terms of indigenous knowledge holders and other members of the society. 
we are pleased to have with us distinguished Arctic youth um, from different parts of the Arctic with us. Uh, without much ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker for today. She's Tesori Landry Parker. Um, I'm really happy to introduce her because she is one of the alumni of the Arctic Frontiers Emerging Leaders. Some of you may know I'm, I was a former coordinator for Arctic Frontiers Young pro Program. And so seeing Desiree here is uh, pleasing for me. Um, Desiree is currently an instructor at Yukon University, and she is also a PhD candidate in public policy at the University of Saskatchewan. And she's Matisse, and she, something that she's proud about. And then she has um, served in various roles and capacities in her community as director of operations for the Matisse Nation in Saskatchewan, and also director for intergovernmental affairs and a senior policy um, analyst. So without much ado, I would give the screen to Tessere Lindre Parker to give us her introductory um, and opening remarks. Perfect, thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen there. Okay, so as Larry said, I'm Métis from Saskatchewan. And before I, I, I want to start, um, I just want to acknowledge that although I am from Saskatchewan, I work in the Yukon at Yukon University. I live, the place I call home is Treaty 6 and the homeland of the Métis. And I work in the traditional territory of the Kwanlun Dun uh, First Nation and Tonquachan Council. Today, I'm going to talk briefly um, just about Indigenous engagement in the adoption of energy technologies in Canada. So my background um, is in public policy with a research focus in, in development in general, but specifically energy policy and the engagement of Indigenous communities. So I just want to start with a little bit of a quick background to provide some context of our current energy environment in Canada. So in a time where climate change is, is obviously a hot topic and countries all over the world, as we see, are working to decrease our CO2 emissions, many of our Canadian northern and remote communities are still relying heavily on coal for energy. And the high cost of energy, some of the infrastructure challenges and the harsh climates really indicates that we're facing somewhat of an energy crisis. And there are some technology innovations in power generation that may offer some potential solutions to this uh, impending crisis, but we want to know at what cost. Any of these proposed implementation of these technologies will really require the support of the communities. So one of the technologies that I've focused a lot on in the recent years is small module reactors or SMRs. These are really an emerging technology in the energy sector, nu small nuclear reactors. And recently Canada has released its SMR action plan aimed at um, the future implementation of small module reactors in Canada. So they seem to be a real contender in the energy industry as an alternative energy system to help reduce those carbon emissions. And now while they might seem like an ideal solution um, to combat some of these rising emissions while providing some of the energy solutions such as um, cost of energy and other challenges that were identified by Northern communities, the question remains, how do we successfully incorporate this technology into the current energy mix while respecting the communities? And in Canada, this implementation will mostly occur in remote um, rural and rural communities in the North. These communities have really been identified as ideal locations for this type of development because of their current energy mix being mostly diesel and providing the large, this would provide the largest emission reduction payoff but also because of their small size and lack of grid connection. However, the history of development in our Northern and Indigenous communities in the past contains many examples of conflict and lack of control over the development. This conflict has not been forgotten and it has created this trust deficit that still is very much in need of healing. So any future development SMR implementation will of course require a communication and engagement strategy that's rooted in early and often communication, information distribution based on community desires and open and transparent two-way uh, information flow. But it will also require these relationships to be mended. And then the creation of nurturing of new relationships and of course the inclusion of local control over the development. 
Indigenous participation is integral for driving decisions about the future of Canada's energy mix. And SMR development in Canada will not be successful without the support of Indigenous communities. So I'm going through kind of years and years of research in, in uh, a few short minutes here. So I'm gonna try to be as brief as possible, but you can ask more questions later. Um, some of the issues that we are facing in the North right now are um, engagement fatigue. So we have small communities and they're spread out, out over a you know, wide, wide, wide mass of land. And there's many players in this game right now. We've got industry, government, regulators, consultants, providers, manufacturers, researchers, everybody's out there um, talking about this. And our communities are starting to experience some of that engagement fatigue. The other issue is this need for energy um, recognition for energy sovereignty, especially with UNDRIP, modern treaty agreements, some recent court cases. These all increase that negotiation power for Indigenous communities to assert their sovereignty and fight for free and prior informed consent on development projects. And then, as I mentioned earlier, that trust deficit. Adapting your engagement process to include these key elements um, that I noted in the slide before, that will really increase the opportunity to help form those new relationships in a positive way. And energy literacy. There's a wide variety of energy literacy levels across um, all of these communities, which really leads to one of the most critical pieces, uh, which is understanding that there's not gonna be a one size fits all approach because each region has had different experiences and they have their own unique challenges and needs there's not going to be a framework that's going to work for anyone. And any engagement moving forward will really be influenced by the relationships, impacts and outcomes of past engagements and past experiences. So each process will need to be adapted to these unique experiences while incorporating the space for iterative information flow, cultural appropriateness and increased local control. So the question I'm always asked next, next is, so what should this look like? And this list by no means is, um, is complete. This is based on some of the conversations I've had with uh, community members over the past few years. And an engagement strategy or framework when going into a community on any type of development um, should really be inclusive. It should ensure that your process is designed in a way that respects diversity and promotes and allows for adequate community contributions while building relationships with a diverse group of stakeholders and rights holders. And your rights holders and stakeholders need to be involved as early as possible. This will allow for and encourage active participation and they should be helping with the engagement design. You should be asking, how do you want to be engaged? How do they want to be engaged? And the engagement process must include an authentic opportunity to influence the decision. Um, it should be rooted in trust or the generation of trust and transparency by ensuring that there's well-defined terms um, of engagement and outcomes unique to the specific nature uh, and needs of each community. And the process really needs to have a mechanism built in for objective and timely and accurate information sharing. This will enable communities to be able to make self-determined informed decisions about their energy generation, as well as being uh, willing to collaborate and truly understand what each group brings to the table. An example of this is how can a community help our, our understanding of energy through an Indigenous knowledge lens or through knowledge co-production? And relationship building, such an important one. This needs to be rooted in mutual trust and respect. It's really integral for a successful engagement process. And noting that relationships are, that are built are really non-linear and they're ongoing. They don't end when a project ends or a project phase ends. They are necessary if you want to have successful co-production um, and remedy that trust deficit that's been caused by past engagement. And finally, an evaluation mechanism to monitor and mitigate risks and to promote continuous improvement in the engagement process. So that was a lot in a few minutes, but some key takeaways, if I had to summarize, um, SMR implementation is really dependent on community support. Meaningful engagement and involving the communities will be integral to developing support for SMRs. And community support for development is increased when the framework for engagement is extensive and inclusive. A poorly ex executed engagement um, and involvement process could also jeopardize the overall implementation and adoption of SMRs, which could hinder um, Canada's reduction in GHG emissions, as this is a large part of our, our reduction plan. 
And finally, and most importantly, Indigenous nations are self-determining nations. Local control will have to be central to the implementation and success of any new development. Thank you. Thanks very much, Desari, for a very snappy and um, concise presentation. Uh, just thinking um, quickly about these SMRs, I've been reading about them a while ago. Um, what is the acceptability level within the community? Do people think of some of the negative effects that um, I mean, using SMR could have on the environment because there is mining of uranium, which is used for this, um, for the SMR. It, what is the level of understanding within the community? I think that, you know, all communities are different. So I definitely don't want to, you know, overgeneralize here because there are some communities who have very specific views of SMR development. Um, but overall, there is a balance between the um, being that uranium, we, we mine uranium in northern Saskatchewan. So we have a lot of nor northern communities who have an economic benefit from that mining. Um, there's that part to it. And then there's also the environmental impacts of their current energy system um, that is happening. And these impacts are beyond just, you know, what we see from diesel emissions. They go into food sovereignty. So a lot of the energy in the communities is extremely expensive. So the food that's already quite difficult to get up up north is now even more expensive because although energy is subsidized for individuals, it's not subsidized for businesses. So they have to compensate for the energy of the store being open and so on. So there's there's a kind of a trickle effect of that. So there is this openness to, to learning more about it. But again, it really is about that energy literacy. How do we create and give the information so that people can make those decisions from an informed place themselves, um, whatever that decision or support or non-support would be for it. Yeah, thank you. We would go uh, into this discussion more when we get to the question and answer session. Um, I would like to invite our second speaker for today, Haley Hannah Stipperton. Um, Haley Hannah is a Cuton and she is also a PhD candidate in Native American Studies at the University of California in Davis. Um, her research draws on Native North Pacific perspectives on food sovereignty and environmental justice. And Helena aspires to address systematic issues in rural Alaskan education. Uh, first of all, fostering a community of autonomous, self-reliant and self-sustainable indigenous peoples for the futurity of indigenous knowledge. Um, Helena, I think that you can do justice by introducing yourself more and then also giving us your presentation. Oh, thank you for that, Larry. Um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen. And Ang Alarum Ayra Asak Dakok, Unangach Akok, Akutanum Asa Achen Ingira, Ilran, Angir Dakok, Ama Arak Dakok, Unangam Tinu Achirakok, then Inam Tanang in Kuran, Anarizak. Sorry, that's a new Nangam Tinu, so um, <laughs> I'm watching this, the words at the bottom. That's not correct. But um, I introduce myself in my native language, Unangam Tinu. I, my name is Haley Hana Alarum Ayra Stepatin, I'm Unangach. I was born and raised in the village of Akutan in the Aleutian Islands of Alaska, um, in the village that we call Achen Ingira in Unangumtinu, a place name meaning salmonberry bushes below it. I'm currently living on Denina lands in what is known as Anchorage, Alaska. Um, as Larry mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate in Native American Studies at the University of California, Davis, and I have a designated emphasis in um, studies and performance and practice. So I'm just going to present to you all and introduce briefly my research. Um, my dissertation focuses on the performed and embodied nature of Unangach subsistence cosmologies, but in Alaska, subsistence is usually discussed in legal or policy terms. My work shifts attention instead to the performance performances of sustainability across Unangach timescapes or seasons, and how those inform relationships among humans more than humans and all environmental entities as an intervention to climate change. Through winter months, I feed myself with the foods I catch at home on beaches in Alaska that provide habitats for salmon to spawn and come home to each year. 
as Alaskan days grow, grow longer as they are now, and I'm sure they are across the Arctic, my senses and body slowly awaken with each minute of daylight gained, knowing I must prepare for the harvest that summer brings. In summertime, my family and I fish the tides under an almost endless summer sun. Our bodies know that extended daylight means the time to do the subsistence work we have always done together is upon us. While this practice provides food and supplies for our families in quote rural Alaskan villages, as you can see on this map here, I just wanted to include um, the different Alaska Native people in Alaska. I know this isn't um, reflective of the entire Arctic, but the Unalak region down here is in the green and it's sort of cut off there. Um, that's where I'm from. Um, the, so these rural Alaskan villages are geographically distant from conventional grocery stores or farms. Um, my dissertation research provides a deeper look into the significance of subsistence lifeways in cosmological terms and not just practical terms. Um, to do so, my project brings critical indigenous performance studies emphases on embodied forms of subsistence practices and processes to bear on questions of food sovereignty and environmental justice in Unangah communities. My tenant Tentative dissertation title is Performing Anungok Subsistence Cosmologies Across Timescapes, Native North Pacific Perspectives on Food Sovereignty and Environmental Justice. I know that's long, I'm gonna cut it down soon. <laughs> but um, my research embraces Unungok scholar, Dr. Eve Tuck's call to refuse damage-centered narratives and Linda Tui by Smith's decolonizing methodologies where I argue that the immediacy of climate change interventions rests upon humanity's need to restore diplomatic and cyclical relations of what Kyle White calls consent, trust and reciprocity with more than human kin in the environment. Um, so my, re my dissertation research, I'm currently, um, I will be starting it soon. I just uh, became a candidate, so I'm like getting there. It weaves together archival embodied and creative strategies to theorize Unangach subsistence cosmologies to generate decolonial Unangach futures. This work expands understanding of subsistence beyond its common definitions as simply the act of fishing, hunting, and gathering to include deeply rooted ancestral processes or methods, theories, and praxis that are inextricably tied to attending of relations amongst human, more than human, and environmental, and responsibilities that are iterated and reiterated via performances. I argue that a critical indigenous performance studies approach to subsistence cosmology, specifically in what I'm calling um, the native North Pacific region, which is, um, I'm from the Aleutian Islands and I've always been like an Arctic imposter of sorts. So it's really nice to be in these Arctic spaces and to be included because the Aleutians are like sub-Arctic. Um, I'm also theorizing this region um, that we're calling the native North Pacific that shares relationality amongst um, people of Olaho or the ocean um, to the Aleutian Islands geographic south and also to our geographic north. Um, <clears throat> so the native North Pacific region contributes significant new directions for indigenous led food sovereignty and environmental justice movements. And I think it gets into some of what this talk is, is talking about with um, knowledge sharing across trans indigenous relations. Through taking a closer look at unangach kakamiroch or subsistence processes and praxis, the world making capacity of unangam to new my native language. Storytelling and the transmissions of oral histories and unangam taleri unangach dance. My dissertation project offers interventions into structure, structures of settler colonialism that position themselves to narrate and diminish subsistence as merely an event. Subsistence instead is an enduring structure of sustainability, laden with protocols, responsibilities, and obligations for maintaining harmony and balance with and among specific local geographies that foster human more than human and environmental survivance. Um, through the discourse of subsistence, my work seeks out the specific stories, everyday practices, environmental protocols, and Unangach values that can provide insights into the ways Unangach live in reciprocity and sustainability with the natural world as a practice of what Gerald Bisner calls survivance. Um, this gets a little deeper into my research, like thinking right now. I took this picture, these pictures in the background in Chalukwach or Nikolski. And it's showing the community seining for red salmon um, or hanyoch um, from the beach in front of Chalukah village as we have always done for 10,000 years plus and as we plan to do for the next 10,000 years. At the center I have kakamiroch which means subsistence. Um, and up to the right I have place-based relationships. 
which I argue um, Unungoh survivance depends on life ways that include Unungoh processes of subsistence methods, theories, and praxis. These include cyclical practices of preparing, hunting, gathering, and sharing in what Robin Kimmerer calls a gift economy. Processes are shaped by patterns of weather and specific cultural protocols around an Unungoh cycle of time or season. They reinforce, tend, and engage Unungoh relations with more than human relatives and rely upon multisensory awareness with and among natural environments and cycles, which are now fluxing and changing in climate crisis contexts. Relationality is grounded in place-based kinship ties, access through physical existence in time and place, or through what Diane Millian calls intense dreaming, or what Lee Miracle would call memory, and ceremonies that activate and facilitate such ancestral connections like dance. In the processes and praxis section over here on the top right, Unungoh subsistence processes and praxis inform and affect all ways of Unungoh life and are evident in Unungoh val values. They inform protocol. They're inherently sustainable and efficient, expanding Unungoh technologies, including but not limited to our um, ancient Ulach traditions, the semi-subterranean sod houses, hunting, gathering and fishing tools, and waste management protocols, reciprocity, stewardship, and res responsibility. And then up at the top, I have protocols here. Um, Following Lee, Mir Lee Miracle's assertion that stories govern life, protocols are iterated and reiterated in oral histories, performances, storytelling, spirituality, and quotidian or everyday practices. And protocols inform diplomatic relations with all creation following Heidi Stark and Leanne Simpson's models of diplomacy. Um, to get back to waste management again, um, more than human lives must receive the utmost respect from humans, which means that every part of a an animal, plant, or being is used. That which cannot be used must be returned to earth so we are not allowed to waste. That's a breach of protocol. Should protocols be breached or should subsistence processes proceed without upholding these protocols, negligence, consequences are told and reiterated in oral histories and dance performances. So we're constantly reminded of these protocols. Some examples of waste management include mid-in sites and organic waste rather than waste from infrastructure or excess materials um, that come with the fossil fuel reliance, shipping and waste from incorporation of Western products into um, Unungoh diets specifically, um, and are required to continue subsistence processes or food access under global capitalist structures. And then um, respect is also part of protocols and it's tied to the above mentioned protocol but extends into performances. So songs, dances, and stories are created and performed throughout winters to model the ways that we are to act with more than human kin, to perform and practice methods to prepare for hunting, fishing, or gathering, to depict multi-sensory attention to more than human kin and life ways, to model interpersonal and trans-Indigenous relations, and to reiterate stories when protocols were breached, offer prayers and gifts in cycles of exchange. Um, so my work is really involved with um, how dance is an embodiment of these subsistence processes to extend subsistence um, throughout and beyond the event. And um, protocols are iterated and reiterated seasonally, continuously, and cyclically. And on the bottom left, Unungoh knowledges are iterative, Unungoh knowledges as iterative. Um, Textual and embodied archives are produced through everyday practices, such as oral histories and performances that facilitate transmissions of cultural knowledge and protocols. Sustainability protocols govern how Unangach live in reciprocity, stewardship, and multisensory awareness or attention with the environmental, human, and more than human relatives. And then Unangach knowledges are reiterative, Unangach knowledges as reiterative, or reproduced through practices and archives such as storytelling and multisensory media and performances. Multisensory methodologies, um, which is something from sensory studies and performance studies, as pedagogy and reiterations of communal responsibilities that perpetuate sustainable subsistence protocols fostering survivance, um, as possibilities to contribute new perspectives on and solutions for mitigating global food insecurity, which we face in the circumpolar Arctic and native North Pacific, and climate change crises. So my work, Theorizing Unungoh Cosmologies, reiterates Simon Ortiz's reminder that oral traditions reflect culturally specific beliefs and worldviews. 
Heidi Stark and Leanne Simpson's methodologies of listening and diplomatic relations provide method to facilitate reciprocity while engaging Unungoch epistemologies and community for my theorization processes. Joanne Archibald's method of performing story research with Native elders and community, which I'm going to begin um, in the fall in the Aleutian Islands, informs how my project engages Unungoch knowledges through multi-sensory studies of stories and performances. And I'm really using knowledge here and like Unungoch knowledge or indigenous knowledge systems in place of traditional ecological knowledges for several reasons that I can get into later. Unungoch subsistence, cause, oh, um, excuse me. Um, Unangach have always honed meticulous multisensory attention, and I would argue that all indigenous peoples of the Arctic. This is a method of Alaska Native survival that the late Unga Yukuk Oscar Quigley discusses. Unangach subsistence cosmologies or worldviews and sustainability protocols as a means to expand the scope of ongoing discussions of environmental justice and food sovereignty in Native American and indigenous studies, um, issues of urgent global significance. So that's my introduction. Thank you for listening. I'm excited to um, talk with you all more. Thank you. Thank you. I cannot wait for us to start discussing further. Uh, but to our audience, if anyone has any question, uh, you feel free to send your questions to Pola at WilsonCenter.org, or you could just tweet at us at Polar Institute, and then we can get to read your your question. Heli Hannah, I was just wondering before we move to the next uh, person. I mean, your presentation speaks about indigenous methodologies and also conducting research, taking cognizance of epistemological differences that we have. Uh, you are into the art, like dancing and so on. How do you relate um, this fine art to issues of epistemic justice and also climate change? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it's, I came to the arts early in my um, academic career and it felt right for me. It felt like a memory awakening when I was reconnecting with like dance and these different arts because Unangach um, practices and process, processes are inherently like arts. They're inherently embodied practices. So it was easy for me to use the language of the arts to discuss like subsistence. Um, once I was like trained in dance and, and um, all of these different performance studies things, I was like, oh my gosh, these are actually like indigenous processes. Indigenous peoples are performers and these things have been um, done before the language of um, dance or performance studies was ever imposed onto it. And I'm not trying to impose the language of performance studies onto these subsistence processes and practices um, that are intertwined with food sovereignty and environmental justice and climate change. But I just found it as a, a natural way for me to discuss and to research and to study and to write about and to create about um, the different issues that Unangoch, where I'm from in the Aleutian Islands are facing in the um, climate crisis. So it just felt natural for me. It felt epistemologically true for me, like um, the ways that Unangoch knowledges are embodied and the ways that stories, so storytelling is really important to my research as well. And um, I had always felt before that the limiting like textocentric the textocentrism in the academy has always been um, invalidating for Unangoch and indigenous knowledge systems. So I prefer to approach my research from a, a, like a language and a lens and an ontology that makes sense for um, the peoples that I'm engaging with that feels like epistemic um, justice, as you said. Thank you um, for your presentation. Now we switch our focus a bit to the biologists and to get some perspectives uh, in the different field. So the, our next speaker is Peter um, Haldarsson. Uh, he is a biologist from Iceland and, a, and he, has also, he has a postgraduate uh, diploma in public administration as well. Uh, Peter is part of the Arctic Youth Network and currently he's a board member of the Icelandic Environmental Association. Peter, we are happy to have you have the screen. Thank you very much. And hello everyone and great to be here. So yeah, so I'm from and in Iceland and I wanted to share a little bit about, I guess the background story of how I got here um, and is in the Arctic Fora. 
uh, and it basically um, came about while I kind of by accident got pushed into environmental advocacy. And this picture I chose for a reason, and you can see the, I guess the contrast uh, in the landscape uh, in Iceland, where you can see the small uh, spring and, and the glacier in the mountain up, um, behind it. And if we zoom out a little bit, this is actually a mountain uh, and in that region, I was uh, during my bi biology studies, I was working there uh, as a summer job as a park ranger. And there you can see where that picture was taken. Uh, and if we go a little bit um, to the right, uh, I just wanted to show you that's actually the house where I stayed while working there. And just to give you a bit of an impression of that place, it has, um, you know, very nice um, views, you could say. And if we zoom out a bit further, um, you can see on a relatively old uh, satellite image, uh, there you can see the mountain and the region where I was, you know, working as a park ranger, taking care of that area. Um, and then on either side of that mountain, you can see springing from the glacier in the top right corner uh, are watersheds of uh, pretty big rivers. Um, actually one of the biggest rivers in Iceland. And if we go out even further, you can see on this slightly more recent uh, satellite image that there's actually some pretty big uh, reservoirs. Um, so these um, reservoirs and the biggest one is, you know, almost 60 square kilometers. Um, they were actually created or built uh, in the early 2000s um, to create electricity, not for the, you know, local communities, but for actually for an aluminum smelter. Um, so it's not, you know, so as you can see, this uh, this obviously created a lot of uh, controversy at the time. And, and currently, there's a lot of trauma in the Icelandic uh, society after the polarization and how this was, you know, pushed through the parliament and so on. Anyway, so I was working there uh, in that region as a park ranger uh, under the kind of the looming shadow of this, you know, colossal project that had uh, spurred so much controversy. And just to give you a clearer picture of the scale, uh, you can see it actually is a pretty big project compared to Iceland and has effects all the way to the coast and the, you know, the sediment that the rivers uh, bring forth and so on. Uh, but anyway, so after this um, kind of personal acquaintance uh, with that region, that really led me to environmental advocacy. And um, so there's the Icelandic Youth Environmentalist Association, which is an organization specifically for young people to you know, do environmental advocacy. And you know, I got more active with that organization, blah, blah, blah. And then we had the pleasure of uh, meeting or having visitors from Alaska of the Arctic Youth Ambassadors. It was the second cohort of that program. And that led to a very interesting discussion because, you know, one of the main things we discussed was that, you know, even though we are both or both groups are from the Arctic region, it's difficult to know what's going on in other places of the Arctic. And so without going into further details, with uh, help from many different stakeholders and more, um, the Arctic Youth Network was created. Um, and I guess I want to share with you uh, something I co-wrote last year. So in that context, you know, working in Iceland, in environmental advocacy, having this international fora to work together, um, then last year, uh, with my predecessor as chair of the Icelandic Youth Environmentalist Association, we wrote this handbook about the methodology that we have been using to, well, try to improve the relationship between society and nature. And I'm not going to go into the details, but you can see, you know, there's the, it's split into four slightly, well, pretty short chapters actually. But, you know, introduction, what's the landscape that you know, you face when you are trying to do environmental advocacy, uh, how your organization or this organization fits into that context, and then kind of the arc of 
doing advocacy? How do you prioritize what you're going to work on? How, you know, what can you do to approach it and so on? Um, and then there's just, you know, a, a appendix or what do you call it, a glossary uh, to help read to it. Anyway, so I just wanted to share that brief story of kind of why I got into this. And, and I guess this is a common theme across the entire Arctic. There are these extractive industries, uh, whether it's from the actual minerals or, you know, raw material, or as in this case, they needed electricity where they are transforming some product, uh, which is maybe imported from um, some mining maybe in Brazil, and then they take the aluminum product and, and you know, use it somewhere else. Um, but anyway, uh, just wanted to share how, how I came to this, and I, and I look forward to continuing uh, our discussion. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, and then I wanted to also say that there's an opportunity for panelists to pick one or two points from your co-panelists and then uh, respond to them briefly after their first round of presentation. So I'll just go to the next presenter now, um, Janelle Trowbridge, right? Um, good to see you here. So just by way of introduction, um, Janelle is, an, is also an alumnus of the Arctic Youth um, Ambassador Program. Uh, she understands the importance of environmental security um, to be at the core of community um, wellness. Janelle aspires to foster a vital relationship between communities, indigenous knowledge holders, and science agencies so that we can have an equitable co-production of knowledge. So Janelle, um, we are all yours. Hey. Um... So yeah, I'm Janelle Trowbridge. My parents are Roland and Deb Trowbridge. Um, I was born in Michigan and we got to Alaska by sailing through the Northwest Passage on our family's 30 foot wooden sailboat. And I kind of did junior high and high school in Nome and recently got my bachelor's degree at UAA in biological sciences. Um, I am Dutch and read Russian, so I'm not indigenous. Um, but I, yeah, so something that we're hearing a lot throughout all of these panelists' conversations um, and presentations is relationships. And I'm gonna talk about relationships too. So um, what does the co-production of knowledge look like in science? Um, science, Western scientists and science doesn't have a great record of facilitating the co-production of knowledge. It's been scientists being like, ooh, I'm curious about this thing. Let me find all this information and then just leave. Um, and it's still something present today where most scientists in Alaska, whether they be federal or different agencies, aren't from Alaska. Um, and so that's just for the co-production of knowledge, you, you have relationships with people and, and those people aren't just people that you're, you're harvesting information from and, and moving on. The co-production of knowledge means that people are present for the methods and the analysis and the conclusions and that both parties have the power to, to change the direction of research or change to stop something if it seems inappropriate. Um, so just looking at kind of the scientific world here in, in Alaska, something, a program that I had the privilege of being in um, was the uh, Alaska Native Science and Engineering Program, which people call ANSEP, um, which has kind of helped with accessibility for students from rural Alaska um, and, and indigenous, well, the focus is indigenous students and students from rural Alaska and getting students from all the way from middle school all the way up to their PhD, supporting students through all of those steps. Um, no, um, <laughs> sorry, my puppy's whining. <laughs> um, so I guess it's one thing to tell people, hey, we need, hey, hey, no. It's one thing to tell people we need more um, youth engagement, but it's another thing to have support 
youth through funding or creating spaces for youth to have relationships and connection. Something for me personally, even though like I don't have like really, I don't have generational relationships to the land of, of Nome um, or Alaska, my, my relationship with the land here is kind of just in my developmental years. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I lost my train of thought. So, so something that scientists look at and kind of are realizing is ecosystem management is a way to, to manage. Um, let's say you want to protect salmon. You can't just protect salmon because salmon are connected to different watersheds and how the leaf litter goes into streams and are connected to how you know the stream is shaped so that there is um, the right kind of um, habitat for their eggs or the right amount of oxygen in the water. The salmon are part of a larger ecosystem and, and a larger relationship and so, so are people. Um, and so community health, the land and the environment are 100% part of community health. And a community facing climate change can't have agency or ability to adapt if they're not given power over their land and resources. And so for scientists, I think it's important that instead of coming in and saying, oh, you need me as an expert, you need me, and changing that relationship to we need each other um, and, and working on relationships, not only with people, local people, um, but with land, understanding that like the relationship that Haley Hanna was talking about, understanding people's relationship with land, not just as like a product or an ecosystem service, but as an entity. Um, so yeah, um, kind of going back to ANSEP, for me, moving from Nome to Anchorage was a huge change from being in a small community where everyone you see, you wave at, and to being in, in Anchorage with like, <laughs> your feet never touch the dirt because everything's paved. And then like Nome has no trees. So it was weird being in trees. And then just like being on campus with all these students that don't really understand kind of being off the road system or being more aware of where your food comes from <laughs> or, and those types of things. So ANSA provided a space where I was able to connect with other students and also get scholarship support. Um, and those students also were like, were supporting, um, you know, cultural connection as well, which I, I know is important for students because it's hard to go into like the university system and, and survive alone, um, especially if you're not experienced in code switching between kind of those environments. And so something that's cool like for ANSEP is that myself, like I've recently taken on a new position um, as a, a wildlife biologist. And, and so students in my peer group, a couple other people have taken on those positions where they're getting to be in charge of their own research questions um, or be contributing to ongoing monitoring, but being from the towns that this monitoring is happening around. So there's relationships already there. Um, and so the future of science, I think is like really, instead of being like, oh, ecosystem management might be smart and also being tr like traditional economical, traditional ecological knowledge um, with indigenous peoples isn't like, previously science has viewed it as like, oh, these are just fairy tales or just stories, which is like, that's not the case at all. Um, so building those relationships where there's equitable power in, in, in the research projects that are happening. Um, yeah. Um, so <laughs> that's kind of 
where I'm coming from, where I, I've had experiences as an Arctic Youth Ambassador and having youth voice, but I also think it's important that youth are supported through actually getting into, um, getting support into being within these agencies. ANSEP has been a great example of that. We're ha they're having people who are working really hard on relationships and landing internships and and also creating a, a physical space on campus for students to have community. And yeah, hoping that science, hopefully, hopefully that things like that will allow us to see more Alaskan made biologists and researchers. That's where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I could I can see Haley Hannah nodding. Um, I think that she shares some of the stories that you, you have you have shared. Uh, but before I give you the chance, Haley Hannah, to probably say one or two words to it, I, I just want us to start our discussion in terms of um, our questions for, for the panel. I think we have half an hour left to to, to go on with our program. Um, so my, my question is this, we have heard severally that um, climate change affects the Arctic two times in some places, in fact, three times more um, than other parts of the world. And this doesn't only affect indigenous peoples, but for every person who lives in the Arctic. Um, so Janelle, I want to start with you. I know that you have worked as a member of the polar bear pet patrol team, um, where you have kept your eyes on wild bears that that come into human population and so on. How does climate change uniquely affect biodiversity in the Arctic? So climate change is hard for biodiversity because we're seeing change happen. And yes, the earth has gone through change in the past, but the rate of change is really fast. So animals and food chains and different things don't have the time to adapt, um, which means we're seeing, you know, like habitats being pushed higher up mountains or further north until they're not really existing anymore. So those things have to adapt or die off. Um, so climate change is, yeah, big for biodiversity because it's changing. It's it's changing those, you know when things lay eggs and when the bugs are out and, and when the sea ice cracks open and the algae blooms happen, those things are like, it can change those timing and change the availability and ruin or, or disrupt crucial interactions between species. Um, and, and the water temperature and the acidification can change. So, you know, fish might not be able to spawn in places that they've been able to before. Um, and yeah, sea ice is a big thing for polar bear and walrus. They're having to use land resources, having maybe more conflict with humans. Um, so it's all changing and it's incredibly complex interwoven systems that are all communicating and have evolved together. Yeah. Haley Hanna, you have some experience with subsistence farming. I've seen some pictures of fish uh, fish farming or probably going fishing and so on. How how has climate change uniquely affects biodiversity um, from your experience? Yeah, um, I'll start by saying that it's not farming. Indigenous peoples of where I'm from don't farm. Um, and it previously was like a cosmological dissonance, right? Like we mm. would um, only harvest or gather when the um, earth and the plants and the animals present themselves to us. So farming was a, like a, a disruption. Um, and that's just like a, a slight cosmological thing. I always get thrown into these agricultural conversations because my work is about subsistence and I'm like, oh my goodness, that's not what my work is, it's not agriculture. Um, but yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, the changes we've been witnessing, I mean, I've witnessed them in my lifetime in the Aleutian Islands. I've witnessed the changes and returns even from summer to summer in the past like five to seven years that I've lived in, in Denina lands in South Central Alaska. And these aren't my homelands, um, but I've been fishing here 
um, and gathering and, and like what um, Janelle was saying, it's timing that is really um, affecting their returns. Um, so in the Aleutian Islands, like a lot of our life is built around the returns and the um, migrations of animals, um, salmon and berries. And another major thing that we're seeing in the Aleutians is the lack of snow. Snow coverage in the winter is really critical. Um, it's critical for salmon berries and um, all of our berries. And one thing that I do want to note about that, um, those observations are multisensory in nature and they're embodied and they're witnessed and they're told and retold. And this is the one of the ways that our um, indigenous knowledge systems are inherently interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary. You know, I'm not just an artist, we're also scientists. We just may not be trained in the um, Western language of science um, in the ways that like Janelle or Peter might be, right? But that observation that um, snow coverage in the winter affects our berries and our greens, that's indigenous science. Um, that's Yunangach science. And those are stories that I've, I've heard my whole life, um, the different ways that, that the animals are affected. And then another one of the really scary issues in the Aleutian Islands are the harmful algal blooms. So we've had a lot more harmful algal blooms um, then when I was young and when I was a kid, and this means that we likely won't be able to consume any of the filter feeders or the beach foods that are uh, the tidal foods that are filter feeders. And these beach foods are really important to um, our harvest and to our gathering because we, you know, our diet in the Aleutians, the things we ate wasn't just about like consuming. It's not about consuming. It's about the ways that it makes us healthy to live in reciprocity and stewardship with tidal, food, tidal foods and with birds and with sea mammals and with salmon um, and with each other and with greens and berries and the different performances and processes that we create throughout the years to honor those different relationships. And it, it is all a really complex system, like just like what Janelle was saying. So I could talk about it in the embodied ways, um, but also like that is, I've been really articulate in the academy that this is important. Um, it's an important epistemological paradigm shift to honor indigenous knowledge, indigenous indigenous knowledge systems that include embodied knowledges with science. Like it's not separate, like the arts, dance and science aren't separate things. And in indigenous knowledge systems, we don't have those like boxes that would say that the arts are over here and dance is this and sewing is this and science is that, like it's all woven together really, um, really brilliantly. Um, yeah, that was one thing that I really liked listening to Janelle's talk was that, um, the, the articulation of knowledge systems and epistemologies and like the different ways that Western sciences are hegemonic in the academy and organizations that lead things like climate change mitigation use the language of that and use the methodologies of extractivist scientific methods um, and don't include indigenous knowledge systems or indigenous methodologies. So um, I've been really adamant about um, grounding everything in indigenous methodologies and indigenous um, ethics to stop extractivist research and to allow indigenous ways of knowing um, an equitable and a valuable and a valid seat at the table when it comes to academic knowledge production. Mm. Yes, uh, Desara, do you have any um, experiences to share on this, how someone from the Arctic and live in the Arctic, how climate change has affected or is affecting um, your lifestyle or the lifestyle of your community? Definitely. I, I do just want to reiterate to what Heliana just said. I think that that was so important in the sense that there's this idea in, you know, I'm working mostly in development and, and with, with communities that are looking for development in most cases. The, there's this idea that, you know, we don't, as Indigenous communities, we don't want any development. We're against it. That's not true. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. We just want that place at the table. And we want that place at a table where it's connected to actual meaningful decision-making. We don't just wanna be a box that's checked. And I think that's what's really, really important. And where I come from around engagement practices, that's probably the message I deliver the most is you know, there's just as much, if not more, that this community can deliver to industry or proponents um, than your scientists that you bring in. They're necessary. We wanna hear from them too. We wanna to be able to make informed decisions 
but we also need to look at the science of the community. And, you know, our Northern communities are full of it. The amount of things that I learn, you know, when I go into a new community, a community that welcomes me in that I have not been in before, and the things that they teach me, um, just about weather patterns and ice melting, and, you know, going back to food sovereignty, how the climate and has changed this and how far they have to go out now versus where they did 10 years ago. And how do we maintain that knowledge? And I think that's the most important thing. There's such a, a, a worry that that's going to be lost because our elders are, are getting older and we need to know how, how has this changed? How is the climate impacted? How we get our food, how we support our community and what are those practices that go with it? So I, I think there's definitely something of value that needs to be recognized. And right now it's getting better in Canada, at least it's getting better, but it's not um, entirely recognized yet. And the value is, is exponential. Thank you um, for, your, for your expositions. I go straight to Peter. Peter, um, you are an, an environmentalist and you have even helped produce a framework or a book to guide young environmental activists in, in, in their activism and so on. For you, I mean, we're talking about knowledge systems. Um, how much of indigenous knowledge paradigms is contained in, in knowledge about climate change adaptations? Uh, sorry, could you repeat? I mean, with your work as an environmentalist and uh, with the link of the book you have you have shared, we're talking about knowledge systems here. Um, how much of consideration of indigenous knowledge systems is, is do you consider, or do environmentalists consider in um, the fight against climate change? Well, so basically, uh, when me uh, and my colleague wrote this handbook uh, last year. Um, we were trying to, well, part of the purpose of this handbook was to use it as kind of a conversation starter to share what we have been doing. Um, because we obviously don't have any experience in other knowledge systems, which we do not, um, you know, don't really know anything about. Uh, so I, well, I guess we were partly trying to, you know, put this forth as a conversation starter so we could have a dialogue about, okay, this is how we have been doing things and thinking and could then have a dialogue with others, how they have been approaching uh, similar, you could say, topics. Um, uh, and then also, also simultaneously, we were also trying to, you know, um, at least attempt to improve our uh, own, you could say, cultural context or how the way the way of the, you could say, the Western or Icelandic thinking, because to be entirely honest, our culture is not really super developed in, you know, our relationship with nature and so on. Um, so I guess we're both kind of trying to have this, uh, you know, way of discussing how these different uh, knowledge systems are approaching these things and also trying to somehow improve ours because definitely uh, many of the problems we're facing on the global level uh, relate to how um, there are you could say deficiencies in well, knowledge systems like the western one yeah thanks uh, i'll just um, move to janelle uh, so from the same from the same question and um, there's a recent research in sweden um, that shows that state bureaucrats do not really have so much information even about indigenous epistemologies. And so when issues about impact assessment are carried out, they beg for more explanations or perhaps they carry out some of their decisions without any due regard to this. Uh, for you, uh, as someone who has worked or has volunteered or intended with a state institution, how how do you think that indigenous knowledge system can um, what what kind of effect can indigenous knowledge system have on the measures for climate change mitigation and how can we make state bureaucrats aware of some of these different epistemologies? So okay, there's two two things you're saying. How how do state agencies? become educated on kind of yes. indigenous knowledge systems and then what impact does that have? Yeah. Um, I think 
for for state agencies want to become educated on indigenous knowledge systems, there's plenty of indigenous people like Haley Hana or other leaders that are, are leading research and, and are doing a lot of work to put that knowledge into kind of the, the format that those institutions, kind of the language those institutions speak um, or, or are doing the work to challenge and host conversations um, like the, the, the Alaska, I think it's the Alaska's, there's, a, there's an institution here in Alaska, it's the first, I don't remember the name of it, but yeah, looking, looking, going out and seeking those people who are already doing that and then paying them to educate your people, pay them for their time, pay them for their skills. Um, and then, yeah, bring those expertise into your, your teams um, and, and also hire, you know, the students that are from local areas or local people, but also work on listening to them and giving them power to build network or support them in building network, pay them for the, the network building that they're going to be doing for your agency. Don't just bring them into kind of a talk, almost like toxic environment and then be like, cool, diversity hire. <laughs> and move on. Um, I think, how does that impact research? Well, it makes it informed, right? Like there's so many times where scientists are like, oh, I discovered this new thing or, or look, this species is, is doing this thing. And, and the people that are there are like, yeah, we could have told you that on day one. <laughs> like, so there's a, um, and then just sustainability, right? Like if, if, we're going to make changes or ma monitoring and management decisions to try to adapt with climate change. If you do that without working with the, the people whose land it is, the indigenous people, it's not gonna go well because you'll end up with situations where you're making uninformed in decisions and having fallout where the where there could have been actual relationship building and sustainable choices versus choices that end up being kind of more harmful because they were short-sighted or not well-rooted i don't know if that's helpful or what you were looking for yeah well i think that's um that's the intent of it i have um one question for Tesori, and then I would also throw it to Haley Hanna. Um, we are running out of time, but two minutes each. I mean, this is um, one of the cracks of, of our panel. It, it has to do with the recent surge of extractives in, in the Arctic, uh, both mining and wind power, what we now call wind farm in, in, this, in this edge towards green shift and so on. But then this green shift has its own repercussions on indigenous people's lands and livelihood and so on. Um, but how do we reconcile this paradox of extracting natural resources for a greener world? And at the same time, the repercussions that we may have on indigenous people's livelihood. That's all right. Yeah, I think I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but it's really about local control and local drive, you know, the locals driving that mm -hmm. um, and those initiatives, because again, it's not that, you know, Indigenous people or all Indigenous communities are against development and against, you know, wind farms or green shifting of any type of technology. It's just a matter of it being done properly and coming from the right place. So I think, you know, as an, as an Indigenous woman, I have to remember that my responsibilities to that title come first. And for communities, each individual, each person has different responsibilities as well. And having that outlook when we're talking about development and understanding that, you know, those Indigenous ways of knowing and doing are linked to these responsibilities and that's what's going to come first. So it's going to be a collective benefit. And whereas industries that come in that are generally driving these technologies that are, you know, classified as, you know, uh, green shifting technologies, they're coming in with different responsibilities and different priorities that generally aren't that. There has to be a bridge between those two. And, and you know, looking at, I mean, 
Heliana mentioned numerous theorists that, that um, give great perspective into indigenous ways of knowing and indigenous methodologies, but making sure that whatever comes of that is rooted in that. Two-eyed seeing is another one I, I think that wasn't mentioned earlier that is one way of where you can look at the best of both and, and figure out how to reconcile that. It's not easy. And your question was specifically, how do we reconcile that? There's, in my opinion, there's no answer. Um, because as I said earlier, it's unique to that community, it's unique to their experiences, and it's unique to their responsibilities that they have. Um, I can't speak to a community that isn't mine. Um, all I can do is present back the words that they share with me. And that's, you know, what I, what I hope to do well, but I hope that industry, government, agencies are all coming in and approaching things from that uh, Indigenous methodological lens as well. And if they haven't, they should read Linda Tuali Smith because uh, that's a good place to start. <laughs> mm. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Haley Hanna. Yes. Um, but I, I think that, yeah, just speaking up from, from where Desore just ended, I think that there's also the issue of, of FPIC in terms of um, would Indigenous people be consulted? Would their right to say um, yes or no be a veto? Or actually, it does depend on the nature of the project itself. What benefit does it have for the society or what, what, what kind of um, repercussions it, it has? So, what do you say? Do you think that do you agree with this already that there's no like a straight jacketed way to to look at this, but then it it should probably depend on what benefits the, the community derives from it? Yeah, I I agree with this right. I would completely shift the directionality of of that, like another community coming in and bringing something else to an indigenous. I don't think that's the way that change happens um, personally. And my work is really rooted in indigenous resistance and resurgence movements, um, such as the ones happening in Kanaka Maoli, um, Aina. Uh, and their resistance to, to green energies that has been brought to them. So I think the whole directionality like needs to change um, instead of like assuming that it's outsiders coming into native communities and bringing like this green energy. Um, so I'm like all about indigenous resistance movements and organizations like the Just Transition Alaska and um, all of these different things in my work um, because I understand subsistence or um, food sovereignty and environmental justice as environmental resistance to settler occupation and invasion, which also means like a resistance to settler or outside epistemologies that are continuously imposing power and dominion over indigenous knowledge systems. And parts of this resistance includes trans indigenous collaborations and coalition building like what we're doing now across the Arctic um, to continue movements against environmental destru destruction, which does affect Unangach and circumpolar Arctic indigenous access to our food life ways. Um, and it interrupts transmissions of cultural knowledge related to subsistence processes, sort of what Desiree was talking about earlier. Um, but particularly, I, um, instead of like, a lot of the um, responses to climate change, especially in Alaska, where impacts disproportionately experience are experienced by Alaska Native peoples or in the Arctic by Indigenous peoples, um, often center the urgency and precarity to implement alternative forms of energy, like this green energy movement. Mm -hmm. Would, but that's why, like, my project is taking a different approach. I'm suggesting focusing attention instead on repairing interpersonal kinship relations that Unangach subsistence practices depend upon. Um, and it also like addresses the green foods narrative. Um, and I'm refusing the white stream neoliberal green foods um, movement in the United States that is affecting rural Alaska. And it does come to um, rural villages through introducing a paternalistic dependency on outside foods, which affects our subsistence life ways and ignores like our, our cosmological connections to these different food ways. Um, so yeah, I think it just it just needs to happen in a like if we reverse the unidirectionality of um, assuming change or shifts um, through centering and having these like deep conversations and coalition building and collaboration and um, with indigenous communities and and doing it ethically in a with by and for method rather than an extractivist like I'm going to tell you what we're going to change sort of thing.
if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Great. Um, time is just staring at us, but I think we are doing good on, on, on time. Uh, I have my last question. I'll just give it to Peter and um, to Janelle, and then you could just also have add your concluding remarks before I take the final ones from um, Haley Hanna and Tesori. Now, um, sometime in January, we, we had the foreign minister of Norway, Anasarida, who, in Anasarida, who, who said that Arctic policy of Norway is influenced by the people who live there. And she said specifically that this policy would be informed by knowledge, it will be informed by facts, and it will be informed by expertise. Going back to this um, epistemic justice and how we consider indigenous people's knowledge, we are on the concept of meaningful engagement and co-production of knowledge. We know that co-production of knowledge offers a lot of opportunities um, for, for, for knowledge growth and for practical knowledge systems. What does meaningful engagement mean to you as a biologist um, in, in the field of environmental activism, Peter? Well, I guess, um, especially from my perspective of um, being from Iceland, I think the main challenge is, challenge is here that there are these very powerful stakeholders like the you know Arctic states and, and national states around the world. Uh, and they usually the people in there and their structures have their background and they might not even, you know, they might know that there are have heard of that there are those, you know, other knowledge systems and so on. But I think maybe one of the main challenges is that they genuinely don't comprehend, you know, what that really means, you know, mm -hmm. how deep it actually goes to have um, different knowledge systems uh, and kind of the significance of that. Um, so I guess uh, what I'm really reflecting on, and especially the more I learn about uh, those other knowledge systems, uh, which have these deep rooted connections uh, with the rest of nature and so on, um, I'm starting to think that we kind of the main challenge we need to is how do we communicate that, that we have these different knowledge systems and how do we in a practical way really kind of get the knowledge systems on a peer-to-peer -peer basis as you would do with uh, different communities. So it's not just about bringing all the people in the Arctic together, but also, I guess, on a slightly broader level, how do we Yes, communicate, uh, and I guess that's I'm not, I'm maybe not a simple task, but I think what we really need for, especially those who have a lot of power and influence in the Arctic, uh, they really need to learn the significance uh, of the importance uh, of uh, the diversity of the knowledge systems. And I hope that <laughs> answers it a little bit. Janelle, yes, you have the screen. So the question is, what is meaningful engagement? Yes. Um, what does meaningful engagement uh, mean to you as someone who, was, who is working with wildlife? Um, well, there's like all sorts of types of engagement, right? There's like collaborative engagement. There's mm -hmm. like outreach engagement. There's just sharing engagement. But I think in all of those, um, meaningful engagement for me means that it's not coming from like anyone's ego. <laughs> it's not like ego conflict. Um, and that it's that you're seeing curiosity. Um, and, and you're seeing people being open to multiple ways of knowing. Um, and there's vulnerability and people, people looking at their values. Um, I think a lot of engagement conflict is just conflict of values. And so just having curiosity about each other's values um, and seeking to understand those. Yeah. Yes, um, Haley Hanna, in one minute each with the story, um, what is your, your thoughts on meaningful engagement as an indigenous person in terms of co-production of knowledge? And then I will take the last word from the story after you, Helihana. 
for me, it just um, is based around community based research um, engagements that are conducted with by and for communities, um, which really gives power and decision making and like methodological building and research design into the hands of the communities that I'm working with. Um, so I think it's just like being a translator like from the academy to my community um, translating and sharing rematriating knowledges rematriating um, information that have been gate kept outside of my community so it's just about like upholding my responsibility and using the power and privilege that i have in the academy to share and just to resource share and to knowledge share and to give power back to my community that's how i understand a meaningful engagement yeah giving power back to you community. I'm giving power to you, Desiree, to give us your last word. I don't know how I can follow that because I think that was really good. I, I, I love the concept of um, leveraging power because I think that that's what I try to do every day. That's part of the responsibility that was given to me and that's what I want to do with my engagement practice, not only when I'm engaging as a researcher but also helping other people engage. I want to make sure it's designed by and designed for and more than anything I want to be able to create space for those voices that have been marginalized in the past. I want to create the space to rise them up and really ensure that they are actually being heard and that it is meaningful, that it is something that is there. So um, that, that's really what it's about for me. It's, it's leveraging whatever powers I do have to really ensure that I can help create that space or encourage others to create that space. Yes, um, thank you very much. I think that the time has passed so quickly, uh, but I'm sure that we've really had um, an exhaustive discussion of the topic on climate change and biodiversity action and research. So thank you very much. I think much talk has been done, yet much work of the talk needs to be done. And so we are hoping that next year when we meet again, we'll be able to take stock of the actions that we have taken individually in our communities and in our various action. So thank you for joining us. Uh, I think this is the end of this session. Uh, and I think in the next five to 10 minutes, we would have the next session on political um, leadership. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just end off by saying that I just wanna congratulate you all on this panel because we all attend many panels on climate change and biodiversity action research. And I'd say that this one is unique and very powerful and one that many people should be watching to see how youth are now thinking about co-production of knowledge about the environment and how we'll move forward uh, in the next 25 years. So please, um, Join us in, in 10 minutes after the hour for our next panel on political leadership and governance, where I'm sure we'll have even more enlightening discussions. Thank you all.